Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Oleg. I will be joined by Sally, who will take over halfway through the presentation. And before we begin, we'd like to thank you for being here. It's always wonderful to meet customers and colleagues in person and interact and just exchange ideas or just chat. And it's been a little bit of a rough few years for all of us, so it's wonderful to have you here. Also, thank you for being here this late in the day. I'm sure we're all a little bit tired, so we're going to try to make it as entertaining as possible. So welcome to Deep Dive in Amazon S3. We do this type of session every year, and every year we discuss slightly different subjects, all relevant, all interesting. But this year we decided to take a step back, way back, and ask ourselves, what would be the most important things, most impactful things to focus on during a deep dive on Amazon S3? Because the subject is, well, as deep as it is wide. Uh, we could have talked about many, many features in Amazon S3, new releases, customer stories, maybe even share some implementation details and best practices. But then we realized, this is a really, really big conference. And all of the subjects are covered in depth in other sessions, and keynotes, and builder sessions, and so on. And I hope we, you guys had time to attend those, or will have time to attend those. And so given that a lot of subjects are already covered, what would be the most important thing for us to focus on? And so in the end, we realized that the most important thing for us to focus on is fundamentals. This cross-cutting fundamental principles and mechanisms that underpin everything that Amazon S3 does, and actually everything that any storage system does. And there are actually quite a few. And so after much thought, we focused on four. Now, they're listed in a specific order, but it by no means indicates they're important. We just needed to list it in some order. All of them are very important and existential for storage system. Let's start with durability. It is a core basic property of any storage system that basically states that after an object or a file or any kind of data bit is written into it, it can be eventually retrieved without alterations and will be retained there. Availability and performance, and availability and performance are really the, exactly the same dial. Um, as you read and write data, you typically care a lot about how fast you can do so. And you also care how well you can parallelize your workload to achieve better performance. So of course, we'll focus on that. Now, most data is stored to benefit businesses or research, and those institutions care deeply about cost management. And so we would be remiss if we didn't address how we think about that with S3. And finally, and inevitably, and existentially, security. You want to be intentional about who can read and write data, and probably, more importantly, who can't. There are many other aspects we could have considered, but we only have so much time, and so we decided to focus on this four. Durability is a natural place to start with, because storage system. The most important requirement for any storage system is to retain your data, storing it without losing it. Now, you have probably have heard that Amazon S3 is designed for 11 nines. We will discuss exactly what this means, where this number came from, and why it doesn't describe the full picture, and why durability is more than just this particular property. And so to do so, let's go back, as promised, to fundamentals. Cloud is somebody else's computer. And so all of your data is eventually written on some kind of media. And the first commercially available large-scale media was a hard drive. Now, it was pretty bulky. I've seen, some picture, I've seen some pictures with people next to them, and it requires three or four people to carry it. It's the size of probably a vending machine. And it retained a lot of data for its time, close to five megabytes. It was also very, very expensive. It was close to $50,000, and it was back in 1956. So that was then. A lot of things have changed now, but as we will discover, some actually remain the same, and it's very significant. Hard drives have become more compact, more dense, and substantially cheaper. Certainly not $50,000 for five megabyte. And hard drives to this day remain the workhorses of the, of the cloud. In this, and while we use other media such as flash and SSDs, hard drives are very attractive due to their cost and efficiency. One thing they didn't change about hard drives, though, these, they are mechanical devices. They have spinning disks, and they have a head that travels along the spinning disk and reads and writes the data. And so they have, like any mechanical devices, like any piece of equipment, really, hard drives can fail. 
Now, it's not a very common event, but it does happen. Here are some reasons why can drives make fail. And they all indicate that mechanics, electronics, or perhaps the electric aspect of it, one way or another, went wrong. Stiction is an interesting phenomenon, which I learned about recently, which is basically a phenomenon of the head sticking to the actual spinning disk and causing it to fail. And when we reason about hard drive failures, we use the acronym AFR, Annualized Failure Rate. And AFR varies widely, but these days it's close to, it's typically measured in singular percents, sometimes sub-singular percents. So why does all of this matter? Well, your data needs to be stored somewhere, and when you start to, uh, and if you start building a storage system, in the end, some kind of media, like this hard drive, will have to be used. So how would you try to build it at scale, this hypothetical storage system, uh, dealing with failure? Let's consider maybe a slightly exaggerated example. Let's say we have our micro data center that has 24 hard drives. Now, something really bad happened, and seven of them failed. In reality, in production systems, obviously, this high rate of failure is very, very unlikely. How do we deal with this? Well, the approach has been around forever, and it's fairly obvious. Data duplication, right? Redundancy. You store your data on or chunks of your data in multiple locations at once. Something like this. The color in this case indicates the, the exact data bit. And in this case, our replication factor is two or three, depending on how you reason about it. But basically, the same data chunk is stored three times. So let's see how this particular distribution fared for our failure pattern. Look at the yellow hard drives. They actually look green, but they're meant to be yellow. Now, it turns out they were completely spared by failure. And so when we access data, we can read it, for example, if we're just reading the data, we can read it from any hard drive. That's great. Blue ones, didn't do so well, but still very, but still durable because we still have one replica from which we can read the data. The two others are out and we probably need to do something to replace them. And here we need to be very careful. So when the customer request arrives and we want to fetch some data, we route around the failed hard drives. Otherwise the customer will experience, well, availability issue in this case, but it's also a very important factor. And finally, the red ones. As you see, they haven't really fared very well. All three just happened to have failed. We didn't distribute our data very well. We didn't replicate it across probably appropriate variety of media, or perhaps we just waited too long and allowed a lot of drives to fail. So what does all of this mean? These are fairly self-evident and obvious observations. Well, at scale, media, well, anything really, but media in this particular case, especially if it fails, is relatively hard to manage. You need to constantly distribute your data across multiple media devices. We haven't even covered the fact that in order to implement this repli replication that we talked about, each write needs to land to on multiple devices and you need to read about consistency. And you need to be very careful about routing your data, routing your request to only appropriate devices. Now, how do we solve this problem in Amazon S3? You probably have heard of this, but we will go very quickly through this exercise. We also rely on redundancy, but a specific kind of redundancy, specifically erasure coding. How does it work? Well, for any object, we start by chopping it up into chunks, which we call shards. They typically equally size. In this particular case, we have seven. seven. We then use a specific algorithm, and these types of algorithms have been around since the 60s and 70s, and they were born in the context of reliable signal transfer. And they're called parity shards, additional calculated shards. Why, why is it this way? Well, as it turns out, you can assemble your original object from any seven of the shards. You can take all of the primary ones, you can take all of the parity ones and mix in a couple of primary ones and so on. You have some choices. So it's actually, it, the system is incredibly flexible because you can select which shots to use. And this approach is really powerful because it allows you to control levels of redundancies beside, beyond just we replicate data two times, three times, four times. It actually really helps also with durability and availability goals because it allows to work around very effectively around things like drive failure, availability zone failure, and so on, relatively transparently to the customers. Now, how does it work in practice? Let's look at this pretty video. So when the customer puts an object in Amazon S3, we erasure code it into small little chunks, and we spread it 
as far as wide as we can. What does it mean? Well, we distribute data obviously on different hard drives. We try to, we try to place them against different racks, different data centers, different availability zones, and so on. Conversely, on get, we reassemble these shards and put together into an object. This approach has very substantial benefits. One of them is any individual customer's data, specific object, does not only occupy, uh, is spread across m multiple media devices. And any individual disk actually contains a small part of it. And what this means is that certain failure modes, such as disk failures, AZ failures, and so on, even in the presence of those, we can still assemble data, even if we don't attempt to repair our hard drives. I just mentioned repair. Clever routing and distribution is not enough. You need some kind of a complementing mechanism that actually recovers your media. Otherwise, that exaggerated picture that I just presented may just become reality. And so we call this process repair. It's fairly common sense, but it has some really interesting details that are worth discussing. So how would we reason about it? Well, as we discussed, hardware will fail over time, not only hard drives. Any equipment will, network equipment, individual facilities, and so on. So what, in order to keep up with this level of failures, we need to measure failure rates and then implement some kind of a mechanism that repair, uh, repairs your media. Now, the actual mechanic of repair can vary. Like, in practical terms, we don't obviously pull out the broken hard drive and push in another one. Most of the time, we maintain a pool of additional capacity, which then enters the fleet and receives the replica of your data. But the most important thing is that repair rates need to be keeping up with the failure rates to maintain durability. You also need to uh, track the worst case of failure rates, because in order to ensure high durable posture and strong durable posture, you need to repair even in worst case scenarios. And so this actually, as it turns out, where 11 ninths math comes from. The AFR of the devices we use and the repair fleet we're utilizing and the repair mechanism we're utilizing allows us to keep up with any data decay that might be happening. So let's look what the architecture of such a repair system may look like. It's also fairly simple, at least at this very high level. So here is the durable storage where your object live. And so what we do is we monitor the failure, and we also maintain repair fleet. And a repair gets re uh, uh, failure detectors, report anomalies, the repair fleet picks them up and goes ahead and does whatever needs to be done for, your, for the data shard to be restored. And as I mentioned, this is what the magic number 11 nines come from. But this is not actually enough, because the world is a big and messy place, and things change all the time. And we have to think about things that sometimes are not very obvious. For example, it may be very hot weather where the, the data center is, and maybe there is a power outage in that particular moment. And thus, and maybe cooling system lost its redundancy. Very unlikely events, but they do happen. And in this case, the, uh, the level of failure may increase because some media devices can be temperature sensitive. And so we need to be able to detect it and respond to it. And we do. Okay, so we've talked about redundancy, we've talked about distribution of data, we, talk about, we talked about routing, and we talked about repair. Oh, we're done, right? We're durable at this point. It's more, more complicated than that, of course. Of course, it was a trick question. So, but there is something really interesting what we just did without maybe realizing it. We actually just created a threat model. We ask ourselves what can go wrong. And then we ask ourselves, how are we going to deal with that? And this is a mechanism that is very commonly uh, used in security for decades when individual attack vectors are getting examined and mitigations get, and mechanisms get put in place to address them. So we ask ourselves, for example, questions like, who is the adversary? What are their capabilities? What are they trying to do to us? And this is, a, like, in security context, pretty reasonable question. But what does it mean in durability context? In this particular situation, the hardware failure, the adversary's failure and decay. Well, it's a, almost a supervillain name, but the reality is devices, any sort of a devices and network facilities experience failure. And so they can make our drives and servers fail and destroy enough hardware. Great, so what is the next step? We discussed it, mitigation. So we use data redundancy, failure detection, scalable repair, clever routing, again, 
Are we done? Well, turns out you can't just do it once because the world is a big and messy place and a lot of circumstances change. And so you, you can't just put, uh, put mitigations in place and stop there. You have to keep iterating, measuring, improving. And we call at Amazon, we call this process a mechanism. It's a complete process, a virtual cycle of sorts that reinforces and improves as it operates. So you constantly ask yourself, how effective are we? How cost effective are we? How performant are we? How reliable are we? Resilient and any other interesting cross-cutting concern you may consider and constantly improve the processes. And as the situation changes and the system grows and the customer pattern changes, and S3 has existed for close to 15 years, maybe more. Sorry, I cannot do math right. Actually, more than 15 years now. So a lot of things have changed since then for us. And so this is why we don't only stop there. So we implement a mechanism. We just now discussed the sort of mechanism we can implement for specifically hardware repair. But we actually consider much more than that. Here's just some other threats we consider. We discuss facility failure, hardware repair, data, we're gonna talk a little bit about data corruption and other failure modes, but there are several things here which may be surprising. Bugs, for example, in operational practices. How is that relevant to durability? Well, your hard drives may be perfectly healthy. Your entire data center can be perfectly healthy. There is no fires anywhere and all of the bits are piping across just fine. But you had a bug in your storage node and you just deployed it. In that node, start flipping bits or calculating incorrect checksums or do some other terrible things to the data, as a result of which your durability stance has been weakened. And in fact, you may be writing something you may never be able to read. So you need to reason about this type of failure modes as well. Same applies to operator error when you think about what kind of tooling do you need to put in place to make this process safe. And so these are the things we think about. And there is a variety of mechanisms we employ this is not necessarily designed to be read, but some of the examples of these mechanisms of facility isolation, repair, variety of guardrails, automation, and so on. One thing I would like to note is this process, this thread model building process and creating mechanisms based on, thread, on, on the thread model is universal. It doesn't need to apply to Amazon S3. It doesn't need to apply to durability. It can apply to just about any cross-cutting or specific characteristic of a system that you would like to continuously maintain. And so you too can use a very similar process uh, within your software development cycle. So most of these mechanisms, they exist behind the scenes transparently to you. And ultimately, you don't even know they're there. There are a couple, however, that you can explicitly and intentionally participate on. And we consider one example. Durable chain of custody. This is a very, very fancy word for a very, very simple idea. And the easiest way to talk about it is we'll probably just demonstrate it on a simple diagram. We have a user, we have a bucket, and let's assume that user has been authenticated, has an access to the bucket, and would like to issue a put. This is the interaction diagram. It's very fancy. The reality, big messy world, looks something like this. In reality, your put is traveling very, very far. It travels, uh, maybe it's traveling from your own data center, and so it needs to exit your facility, enter the public internet, go through the variety of intermediaries. Then it reaches the AWS region, and then finally front door of Amazon S3. If you're uh, calling S3 from EC2, for example, the path is shorter, but nevertheless, it's not dissimilar. So it is theoretically possible, even with uh, network level data integrity support, that some of the bits may flip they may, in fact, flip on your own machine in memory as you send in this data or in the NIC. We see these failures a lot. We see failures, for example, also in network, uh, on network devices. And the interesting thing about Amazon S3 is that that is so huge that any theoretical failure that could be experienced, we probably have experienced in practice. And because of that, we had to think about it. But back to this picture. So, okay, so we travel far. What is the problem with that? Well, if the bits flip on the wire, what might end up happening is that you might end up storing the object you didn't mean to store, right? Because by the time we reached uh, Amazon S3 front door, something else may have arrived. We use checksums inside for Amazon S3 to actually control what happens after you enter front door. 
So what it means is that for every put and for every get, but let's start with put, when the object arrives at our front door, if it doesn't have a checksum already, and I'll get into it in a second, we'll calculate it. And then this checksum forever travels with the object. And so with any given point of time, we can immediately detect if something has flipped and the object has altered and thus durability of posture has been weakened. So that's great. We seem to be safe, at least in, um, in some part of this trajectory. Checksums, by the way, I mean, it's a relatively common concept. I'm really quickly go through it. It's basically a signature or a fingerprint of sort that you can generate based on an arbitrary byte buffer. They have this interesting property is that they're relatively compact and they also statistically built algorithmically such that two different buffers are very, very, very unlikely to generate the same checksum. And because of that, you can, if you generate checksum on something and then read that something and check, and recalculate the checksum again, if they match, you can be pretty certain that nothing has changed. Okay, so we say from the front door to the actual Storage node, that's great, but what about all of these other guys? What happens over here? Again, all manner of things can happen. Well, this is where you, customer, come in. Turns out you can participate in this fancy thing called durable chain of custody. And this is one of the reasons that this year, early this year, I believe it was March, we additional uh, checksum semantics in Amazon S3. You may remember that we had had Amazon, uh, MD5 checksum for a while. I don't remember exactly how long, but for years. The issue with that particular approach was, first of all, MD5 is relatively computationally expensive. And secondly, uh, the way the API was built is that you would need to ch send the checksum first and data second. And that means that you effectively will need to scan your data twice. Now this year we delivered several new algorithms, a lot of them are much more performant, and they can, they rely on the HTTP trailer, a thing you send at the end, as opposed to the header. And because of that, you don't need to scan your data twice anymore. And AWS SDK all do all of these wonderful things for you. And so because of that, if you start using checksums, which is relatively easy, and SDKs enable it very, very simply, then you'll, participate in a durable chain of custody, and you have a lot of assurances that your object never gets altered, even if it travels across the uh, wide expanses of the internet. There is a lot more things we can talk about in context of durability, but several points I would like you to take with you is, first of all, um, Amazon S3 is designed for 11 level durability, and that is a function of data decay, AFR, and repair effectiveness. And this is where this number comes from. Amazon S3 looks at durability as an ongoing process. It's a part of the culture. It's not something we do once. It's something that we do every day. And it's also something that you can do in your organization, utilizing threat modeling, utilizing mechanisms for durability and any other similar cross-cutting quality. And finally, for that specific example, durable chain of custody actually starts with you. It starts with the customer. You can participate in that. Okay. So that was durability. Now let's get to performance, availability, and horizontal scaling. We, design, we discussed that Amazon is how Amazon is durably stores your data, but as you start reading and writing it, of course you, you care how fast you can go. And that has several dimensions. Performance of individual operations, which can be latency or throughput if you're streaming an object or pushing an object to S3. But also there is the scaling factor. How many of parallel connections can you open to the same bucket, for example? And so before we examine how Amazon S3 handles these things, let's go back to the basics and consider our hypothetical theoretical system we built of our hard drives. You remember this picture, right? And again, as we discussed, a lot of change, the is some of the things that change. But something else remains the same. Turns out, specifically for random reads and writes, for sequential reads and writes, this number is much better. But for random reads and writes, you can only expect about 120 IELTS. And it was, this number is true today, it was true 10 years ago, and it was true 20 years ago. So what this means is that per terabyte, hard drives are actually slowing down. You can see, and specifically per terabyte, the speed of hard drives is not slowing down, but if you consider capacity, you will see that as the capacity growing, IOPS per ter terabyte is slowly going down. This is referred to as reduced access density. 
And that, as it turns out, has a huge impact on how we design, and by we I mean collective, we the world design storage systems. And to demonstrate how to think, how we think about it, let's consider two very different workloads. One of them, it's a relatively small data set. Well, in the modern world, four petabytes is not that much. And you see that most of the time, the IOPS, so TPS, is relatively low, but occasionally there is this enormous spikes that go up to two million IOPS or so. So let's do a very basic math for our homegrown system, and we're not cons even considering data redundancy right now. How many hard drives are we gonna need for this workload? Well, using our basic math, based on the capacity of 20 terabyte per hard drive, which is a relatively reason common capacity, we're gonna need 185 hard drives. Great, it's not a very big number. And they will do 22,000 IOPS for us. Is that sufficient? No, it's not, because we actually require two million. To support two million IOPS, we actually will need 19,000 hard drives. So IOPS requirement actually pushes hard drive capacity uh, up to 100 times by compared with just the storage footprint requires. Let's consider a diametrically opposite example. Larger data set, close to 30 terabyte. The IOPS, pretty even, relatively small, 5K, maybe 8K and a couple of spikes, but relatively low. And so, once again, to store this data set, we need many more hard drives now, 1,400, which again, it's a bigger data set. And it will give us 168,000 IOPS, which is far, far more than we need, right? And so in this case, storage actually requires 120 more hard drives than IOPS would. Okay, so this was relatively basic math and relatively self-explanatory workloads, right? Small data set, a lot of spikes, large data set, relatively even. Great, so why is this relevant? Well, it demonstrates that scaling storage for different workload profiles is actually very hard. Turns out we have a very unexpected friend in this space, and that is scale. Most of the time, things get much more complicated at scale, but some things can actually get simplified. Imagine that these two workloads were running on the same system. Imagine then there were 10 more workloads, like the first one and the second one, 100, 1,000, and so on. You may see a picture that looks something like this. When you start aggregating these workloads across a variety of uh, when you start aggregating workloads across a variety of data sets and specific spikes, things actually even out. The aggregate looks beginning to look relatively flat. And that is called workload decorrelation. Aggregating a massive number of workloads actually creates more smooth and predictable throughput. It is surprising, but it's true. There is one aspect that we still need to consider, though. How do we make sure that a spiky demand will not laser down individual hard drives. Well, this is where we go back to this picture and start talking about Amazon S3. Turns out that yes, this is helpful for durability, but it's helpful for availability as well. Because remember, any individual customer data occupies only a tiny amount of any given disk, which means that individual workload doesn't typically hot spot a disk. It is spread across many, many disks. And this also means that each disk doesn't serve only workload of an individual customer. In fact, it's workload of multiple customers, to correlation again. And also, it allows us to maximize I.O. And uh, given the capacity of the number of disks, we have a relatively stable, relatively smooth running system. So what does all of this mean? And why, or, or, and why did I mention all of this? And there is one thing that I would like for you to remember from the performance section, uh, section is that Amazon S3 is a massively horizontally scalable system. It may be sort of a trivial statement, but what this means is that Amazon S3 is designed in such a way that it expects you, it wants you to parallelize everything about your workloads and it handles it well. You can achieve very impressive performance through parallelization. Let's consider several aspects of that. One of them is parallelization across multiple endpoints. What is an endpoint? Well, when you connect to, when you open a connection to Amazon S3, to your bucket, you ultimately, at some point, gonna connect to a server someplace. This is one of our endpoints. Now, we have tens and, in some regions, hundreds of thousands of those, and they run independently from one another. And so, 
if you distribute your operations across many endpoints, you actually achieve very high parallelization because, because you have completely decorrelated resources handling your workloads. So in practical terms, it means more threads, more open connections, more workers, and so on. That is typically a very effective mechanism to reduce latency and improve throughput. And Amazon S3 tends to scale very well with that. So we discussed, so this is on individual operations, right? So it, but it turns out the same logic can, can apply to a single operation as well. Just, it's a very trivial graph once again. If you upload a one gigabyte object, it'll probably take you much longer than to upload, for example, one megabyte object, right? But what if you were able to upload the same object in parallel with itself? And what if, after you have uploaded an object, you were able to read chunks of object, uh, chunks of this object also in parallel and assemble them on the client? Well, it turns out S3 does allow you to do that. And uh, we have a feature called multi-part uploads when you can basically chop up your original object into small chunks, completely unrelated to the concept of shards we discussed before, and upload them in parallel with one another, and then complete upload and the object will materialize. Similarly, we have byte range gets that allow you to fetch data out uh, different chunks of the same object from Amazon S3. And if you superimpose this with the fact that you can also open multiple connections, then you can achieve really very impressive parallelism. As you increase the parallelism of workloads, it helps to understand what impact it ha might have on S3 namespace. Now, this may be a surprising statement to make, but S3 namespace, in addition to its actual byte storage also has its own scalability mechanism, and it scales with the request rates based on what we call prefixes. Prefix is basically a leading part of your key uh, combined with the preceding bucket name. And so the keys, with the beginning of which are uh, the same, are likely going to end up in the same prefix. Prefix is an actual backed up by a set of physical resources in Amazon S3, and the set of physical resources Im imposes certain throughput limitations, specifically 35 on puts and 55 on gets. So what happens if you go faster? Well, Amazon S3 will scale out your prefix for you. It will create more. This process takes several minutes, typically, and from workloads that grow gradually, this is a mechanic you don't even need to worry or care about because Amazon S3 will proactively scale your prefixes or GPS is slowly increasing. But if you have a spiky workload, for example, if you go from zero to 15,000 TPS on a, relatively, on a relatively narrow set of keys, then uh, the scaling may kick in immediately, but might take minutes to catch up. And so in this case, you might experience some pushback, which generate five or threes and tell you to slow down, and retries will resolve them. And maybe all of this is okay. In fact, for a vast variety of customers, it is okay, and they don't need to worry about. But if you have particularly sensitive performance workloads, this is something to be aware of. And the easiest to demonstrate it is with a very simple example. Let's consider several, so let's consider uh, autonomous vehicles. I realize it's just not written on the slide. And let's say they sit in the garage and they, kind of, and they drive out in the beginning of the day and then they drive back in at the end of the day and start uploading data for all of the, for whatever it has happened to them. Now, this is one of the possible prefix designs. It's a relatively natural way to organize data. But as you can see, it shares a lot of common prefixes, so they're likely going to end up in the same S3 prefix. And so the performance picture that you may see on this upload may look something like this. So you will reach a certain limit, ignore the numbers on the, the TPS numbers on the vertical axis. They're definitely not quite right. I don't know why it's at 1,000. But you will achieve a plateau at first, especially if you have a massive burst of good put, uh, as, in, as in the requests that have successfully completed. And during this plateau, we will scale out your prefix, and then you will fully scale up your, your good put. And again, in many cases, this is completely fine. But if you want to prevent this, if you want to pre uh, prepare for this proactively, there is multiple things you can do, but they ultimately means design your prefixes intentionally for your workloads. And one of the common mechanisms we, we suggest utilize in this case is what we call entropy. Entropy is something that is uniformly distributed and not obviously correlated with the prefix name. 
some, some customers interpret it as a random number. It is not, but it is typically something you can deterministically calculate because, well, otherwise you cannot really build that key. Uh, but in algorithms like hashes, MD5, or any other similar algorithms, actually can be very helpful as that. To sum up, as a final recap, parallelize everything. Amazon S3 loves you to do that. It's a massively horizontally scalable system, so you can parallelize across endpoints, across individual operations, and use MPUs and range gets. And, you can, and as you do so, there are some caveats around scaling workloads across prefixes, which you also can overcome by a variety of mechanisms, such as entropy. Now, I'm handing the torch, torch over to Sally, who will discuss cost management and security. Who? Thank you, Oleg. Hi, I'm Sally. I'm a software development engineer at Amazon S3. Now that we've covered S3's durability model, performance, and scaling, let's talk about actually storing your data in S3 and choosing the right storage class for your use case. Amazon S3 provides what we call storage classes. You can think about them as sort of a dial that allows you to optimize your cost based on your use cases. When evaluating which storage class to use, there are several factors to consider. The first one is access pattern. How frequently is the data accessed? What sort of latency and availability do we expect? And the other one is duration of storage. How long do we expect to store that data? S3 provides a wide range of storage classes for you to choose from. And here we'll talk about just a few. The first one I want to cover is S3 standard. In some sense, it is a default. It is designed for 99.99% availability, milliseconds latency, and protection against loss of a single availability zone. So this class works well for hot data or data that needs to be frequently accessed. The next one is S3 standard infrequent access, or IA. So if you know that your data is less frequently accessed and not deleted within a month, you can save up to 40% storage costs compared to S3 standard, but with a retrieval fee for accessing the data. So this works well for cool data that requires low latency and high availability. For non-critical data, we also have single AZ options like S3 one zone IA, which can further bring down the cost. You can also archive objects into Amazon Glacier at a 60% lower storage cost compared to S3 one zone IA. Glacier Deep Archive is our storage class with the lowest cost, designed for long-term archive data that is rarely accessed but need to be kept securely. And we have also introduced a new Glacier storage class, Glacier Instant Retrieval, which is great for archive data that needs to be accessed within milliseconds. These are all great options for archive data. And finally, S3 Intelligent Tiering is the only cloud storage class that delivers automatic storage cost savings for customers. S3 will automatically move data to the most cost-effective access tier when data access patterns change without performance impact or operational overhead. So as data ages, their access patterns tend to change and a storage class transition is sometimes appropriate. How can we do that? So if you have predictable access patterns, you can use S3 life cycles to transition to a different storage class. And you can do so based on a variety of rules that can also include your tags and prefixes. But if your access patterns are constantly changing or you simply don't know your access patterns, you can have Amazon S3 analyze your access patterns automatically and move your objects to infrequent archive and deep archive access tiers with S3 intelligent tiering. So let's take a closer look. For small monthly object monitoring and automation fee, S3 intelligent tiering automatically optimizes storage cost based on the access pattern of that data. You can also optionally activate one or both of the archive access tiers, which are designed for asynchronous access. So Amazon S3 will move your objects that haven't been accessed in the last 90 days to the archive access tier, and after 180 days to the deep archive access tier, all within the S3 intelligent tiering storage class. 
any time an object in the archive access tier or the deep archive access tier is accessed, that object is moved back to the frequent access tier in as little as a few hours. So in summary, S3 intelligent tiering can further optimize storage costs when access patterns change without any analysis, operational overhead, or retrieval fees. In order to manage cost effectively and make decisions about your storage classes, you'll need insights into your cost structure. And to help with that, S3 Storage Lens provides storage usage and activity metrics where you can drill down by region, storage class, bucket, and prefix. You have up to 15 months of historical data to analyze, which enables you to analyze long-term trends and patterns. Storage Lens also gives you recommendations for cost efficiency and data protection best practices. And last year, we released CloudWatch integration that allows you to, among other things, utilize alarms and events rules triggered actions. And this year, we've more than doubled the existing lens metrics, adding 34 new metrics across the free and paid advanced tiers, bringing total metrics count to more than 60. With the new metrics, Storage Lens gives you deeper visibility into cost optimization, data protection, access control, performance, and more. So to summarize, S3 provides a wide range of storage classes for you to choose from. S3 offers tools like Storage Lens to help you understand, analyze, and optimize storage. When you need to move objects from one storage class to another, you should use S3 lifecycle rules for predictable or known access patterns. But if you have complex or unpredictable access patterns, you can use the intelligent tiering storage class so S3 can automatically place your objects in the right access tier. Here's our last topic of the day. Let's talk about how to secure your data in S3. At AWS, security is at the core of everything we do. The objects and buckets that you store in S3 are secure by default, and we give you granular controls to share that access with others. For this section, I want to first go through two types of policies that you can use for access controls on your buckets, IEM policy and bucket policy. Then we'll move on to talk about how you can share your data with others within your account or across different accounts. And we'll talk about how to do it securely so you're only sharing your data with the intended audience. We'll also talk about how you can review and audit the access controls on your buckets within an AWS account. And finally, we'll talk about the server-side encryption options that Amazon S3 offers and how to choose the best encryption mode for your use case. When you have data in Amazon S3 and have different users using that data, you need a way to give them access. To do that, you can either define an IAM policy in AWS Identity and Access Management or a bucket policy in Amazon S3. An IAM policy is an access policy that you attach to your IAM user or IAM role, hence it is identity-based. A bucket policy is an access policy that you attach to your S3 bucket, hence it is resource-based. Both IAM policy and bucket policy use the JSON format so we can easily relate one to the other. So let's first talk about IAM. Within your AWS account, here are some basic IAM concepts. First, you have principles. These are the identities in the IAM system. You have the actions that they take. Specifically for S3, say you're reading an object, that action is called get object. And then you have the resource, which is what a principle is performing the action on. And in S3, you can be acting on the buckets for some actions, like listing out the content of a bucket. Or you could be acting on the objects in other cases, like reading a particular object. So how does this model translate into something that IAM can understand and enforce? That'll be an IAM policy. An IAM policy defines what actions can this IAM user perform. It has three mandatory elements, effect, action, and resource. So for this IAM policy, the first element, the effect statement, specifies whether the policy results in a deny or allow. The second element, the action statement, specifies the action that is being denied or allowed. And the third element, the resource statement, 
specifies which AWS resource the policy applies to. So that's all you need for an IAM policy. This IAM policy effectively allows this particular IAM user to read and write objects to the bucket called sample bucket reinvent. So who gets to apply IAM policies? Well, if you are the IAM administrator for your AWS account, you define IAM policies and attach them to IAM user or IAM role within your account. And you can further allow an IAM user to assume an IAM role. With role assumption, the IAM user inherits the permission of the IAM role. Instead of using IAM policy, you can use bucket policy in Amazon S3. So this is a resource-based approach because it defines permissions for your S3 bucket. A bucket policy defines who can access my bucket and what actions can that user perform. It is very similar to the IAM policy that uses the JSON format, but it requires an additional principle statement that states who the policy covers. So here in this example, the bucket policy allows AWS account ID 12 ones to read and write objects to the bucket called sample bucket reinvent. The principle statement in a bucket policy can accept a variety of input, including AWS account and root user, IAM users, federated users, IAM roles, assume role sessions, AWS service principles, and anonymous user, which is the same as public, but we do not recommend that for obvious reasons. And you can further add granularity to your IAM policy or bucket policy with a condition statement. Here in this example, we add a condition that only allows access to objects that have the reInvent tag on them. And we have many more condition keys that you can work with for granular controls. For detailed descriptions, you can go to the AWS documentation page and search for condition keys for Amazon S3. Next, we'll move on to the second main concept and talk about access within your account versus access across accounts. When you only have IAM users within your AWS account reading or writing data to your S3 buckets, you'll either need an IAM policy or a bucket policy to provide that permission. But as you expand your use of Amazon S3, sometimes you want to share your data with someone from an external account. If you need to set up cross-account access, you'll need both IAM policy in the account that owns the IAM user and bucket policy in the account that owns the S3 bucket. This is because S3 buckets are private to the account that owns them by default. For cross-account write, the writer of the data owns the data. So in this example, we have an account in, a user in account A writing data to a bucket in account B. The resulting objects are owned by the object writer, account A. The objects cannot be read by the bucket owner, account B. And the objects cannot be shared by the bucket owner with another account, say, account C. Now you might be thinking, I'm not a fan of this limitation. When other people put buckets into my, whoop, put objects into my bucket, I want to be the owner of those objects. And for customers using bucket policy to enforce access control, bucket policy is only applicable to objects owned by the bucket owner. How can you ensure that you own all the objects in your bucket without relying on the permissions configured by the object creator? Here's where the bucket level object ownership setting comes in. When you set object ownership to bucket owner enforced on your S3 bucket, every object in that bucket becomes automatically owned by the bucket owner. If you were previously using access control list, they can be disabled as you can now exclusively rely on IAM policies for access control. Access control list will no longer affect ownership or permissions for your S3 objects with this setting. So here's what you'll see on the AWS console. For this bucket, once you select bucket owner enforced, you as the bucket owner automatically own and have full control over all the objects in this bucket. So this setting can be applied to a new or existing bucket and can be turned off at any time. As your bucket evolves and becomes a central location for storing shared data sets, your bucket policy can become more complex. You'll probably spend more time to audit and manage it. Amazon S3 Access Point, a feature that helps you simplify access management for shared data sets. In a nutshell, you divide access to your bucket into multiple access points for different groups of users. 
And here in this example, we divide cross-account users into three different groups, finance, sales, and dev. Each group reads data from a designated access point that has its own access point policy. With Amazon S3 access points, you effectively decompose your bucket policy into separate access point policies that you can manage more easily. Within each access point policy, you can further add granularity to your permissions. In addition, you can use access points to restrict access to specific virtual private clouds. Now here's a screen that you may all be very familiar with. In the S3 console, we have a total of five buckets. The access column in the bucket overview page shows the status for my buckets. And here we have one bucket that has public access and another bucket that has objects that can be made public. That doesn't sound right. I can probably just go ahead and click on that second bucket and change the bucket policy. But what if I have 500 buckets and half of them have public access? How do I easily correct this mistake and prevent it from happening again in the future? To guard against accidental public access, Amazon S3 block public access is a feature that applies a blanket protection against public access. This feature can be set at the bucket level or at the account level. It provides protection against permissions from access control list, bucket policy, or both. Going back to our previous example, after I turn on block public access at the account level, all of my buckets are protected. The two buckets that were previously flagged are now secured and not publicly accessible. Oops. Once you turn on block public access at the account level, this setting gives you the overarching protection across all of your buckets and overrides your individual bucket setting. Customers wanted a way to review their existing permissions and prevent unintentional access permission. So for this, we introduced Access Analyzer for S3. This feature analyzes permissions for your S3 buckets in an AWS region and provides a simple dashboard that shows buckets with public access as well as buckets that are shared with external entities. So let's take an example. Here in this example, you can select Access Analyzer for S3 on the left panel. Once you click that, you'll see a dashboard that contains Access Analyzer findings. Access Analyzer reviews your bucket policy, access control list, access point policy, and block public access settings to produce findings. It'll list buckets that have public access on the top panel and buckets that are shared with external accounts on the bottom panel. It'll also tell you the means that granted the access, such as bucket access control list in this example. When you share your buckets with external entities, we generally recommend three best practices. So first, run Access Analyzer to understand how your buckets are being shared. And second, you should keep public buckets in a dedicated AWS account so you can enable block public access at the account level everywhere else. And third, you should enable bucket owner enforce in S3 object ownership to standardize object ownership in your bucket in order to leverage bucket policies. Finally, let's talk about encryption. S3 offers several options for server-side encryption. First, we have SSES3, where S3 manages your encryption keys. When you select SSES3 encryption, S3 generates a unique encryption key, encrypts your object with that key, and then encrypts the key with the regional root key that is regularly rotated. Customers do not manage their own key policies, and encryption is not logged in CloudTrail. SSES3 is offered to customers free of charge. Alternatively, you can choose SSE KMS, where AWS Key Management Service, or KMS, manages your encryption keys. With SSE KMS, S3 calls KMS on behalf of the customer to generate a unique encryption key, which is then used to encrypt the object. The encryption key itself is protected by a KMS key. When you use a customer-managed KMS key, you can manage key policies, configure how often you'd like to rotate the key, and any usage of the KMS key will be reflected on CloudTrail. And you'll be charged for each request made to KMS. Another option is to use SSE KMS with an AWS-managed key, but you won't be able to manage key policies or control the rotation schedule of that key. 
And since you cannot change the key policy, you will not be able to share your data with external accounts as they'll require access to your KMS key in order to successfully encrypt or decrypt the object. So the best option is to use SSE KMS with a customer managed KMS key as it gives you the most control and visibility into how you encrypt your data. Default encryption is a bucket level setting that ensures all, uh, all the objects stored in the bucket is encrypted on the server side. When you turn on default encryption on your S3 bucket, all new objects will be encrypted with the type of encryption key that you configure. We support SSDS3 and SSE KMS for bucket level default encryption. So as we just talked about, for KMS encrypted objects, S3 calls KMS on behalf of the customers to get encryption keys to, in order to encrypt or decrypt the data. Due to the volume of their workload, some customers could encounter KMS request rate throttling and unexpectedly high cost due to repeated calls to KMS from S3. So Amazon S3 bucket keys is a feature that is most useful for high volume workloads accessing KMS encrypted objects in S3. It can help you reduce your KMS calls, resulting in an improvement in encryption performance and reduction of KMS costs by up to 99%. So if you want to use KMS-backed encryption, using bucket keys is highly recommended to reduce your cost of encryption. So to summarize, you can control access to your bucket with either an IAM policy or a bucket policy within your account, and you'll need both to share your account to uh, sh share your bucket with an external account. To share your bucket with different groups of users, consider using S3 access points. You can ensure that the bucket owner owns all the objects inside a bucket by enabling bucket owner enforced in S3 object ownership. You can prevent a public access with S3 block public access and review access controls with Access Analyzer. And finally, we recommend enabling server-side encryption to increase your security posture. If you're using SSE KMS encryption, you should use a customer managed key instead of the AWS managed key. And consider enabling S3 bucket keys to save on KMS costs. If you want to continue your AWS storage learning, please visit aws.training storage. You can find the AWS skill builder to build a learning plan, increase your knowledge using the ramp up guides, and earn digital badges to demonstrate your knowledge. Give everyone a second. Thank you. Uh, session survey should already be on, in your inboxes or on your app. Just as we love getting your feedback on Amazon S3, we'd really appreciate your feedback on this session. Thank you.